Hi, this is author Hank Garner. Thank you for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. This week, my guest is Risa Walker. We had a little bit of audio trouble at the beginning of the episode, so the first 30 seconds or so is cut off, but we'll join the podcast in process. And remember, you can find all the archives at hankgarner.com. But um, those kind of, I always knew I wanted to write. Um, but I convinced myself somewhere along the way that I would not be able to make it as a fiction writer uh, simply because I lived in a little tiny town in the South and nobody there had ever been a writer and, um, well, a variety of things. I also figured out fairly early on that I was going to be um, at least partial support for uh I, I, my adult son, my son is now 30. And so as a result, I decided that I needed to focus on something that might actually earn a living. <laughs> so I finished college, got my PhD and focused on an academic career and academic writing. Wow. What is your PhD in? It is in political science with a focus on political history. Of course so, it is. Y- I, a lot to, exactly. So, it, right. I mean, history is, it, as a history professor who has been a sci fi geek since I was like nine or ten years old and first saw Star Trek, um, time travel was kind of inevitable. Oh, <laughs> That's yeah. That's where I was going to end up. So, now you said you're a sci fi geek since nine or ten. What was your, your entree? Was it uh, Star Trek? Is that what you said? Oh, it was absolutely Star Trek. Absolutely. Um, uh, and also, and I can't, couldn't tell you for the life of me the name of the volume of sci-fi stories, but um, my uncle, who was like seven years older than me, had to write a book report when I was about 10 years old, and he didn't want to write it, and knowing that I was a bit of a nerd and could probably write something that would pass for him, he handed me the book and said, pick a story and write me a book report, and he offered to give me like two bucks or something, and I got the story done for him, but almost didn't because I read all the stories. <laughs> and there was some Heinlein in there. There was, uh, oh, what else? There was uh, a couple of Asimov stories, which yeah, I'm not a big Asimov fan. He doesn't have characters I like as much. But a lot of stories in there that I absolutely, some Ray Bradbury that I absolutely love. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so I sat there with that book and read it, and it wasn't until he came in and threatened me that I actually wrote the book report. <laughs> What was your favorite Heinlein story? Oh, let's see. That's tough. Probably Time Enough for Love, maybe Stranger in a Strange Land, somewhere between those two. Yeah. it's. Uh, I, I have uh, very fond uh, memories of reading uh, Have Space Suit Will Travel when I was yes. in like the fourth or fifth grade, I think. And, man, that story had such a profound uh, impact on me. And uh, I recently handed it down to uh, the, the copy that I've had forever to my uh, now 11-year-old. He was 10 at the time, and, and he read it at the same time that I read it. And it's just a magical thing, you know. It, it is. I love being able to hand books down to my kids. Um, I've already done it w- once with the son who's an adult, and now getting to do it with two younger sons again. And um, I didn't have a lot of people to talk sci-fi with when I was a kid and I actually didn't get a lot of science fiction because I got my books handed down to me from one of my grandmothers and she read a lot of Louis L'Amour and oh, yeah. Barbara Cartland and <laughs> so that those were the books I had and whenever I got a chance to get something else it was always sci-fi and fantasy and then Stephen King once I was able to get that. So. But uh, anything that teaches you how to you know build characters and uh, devise a plot and you know, take those beloved characters and put them in trouble. As uh, uh, I, I, all those things work as building blocks to our creativity. They do. They absolutely do. And I think, in some ways, the fact that I didn't have a new book constantly. I was. I joked that the Kindle may have been a deal between my adolescent self and the devil because I would have <laughs> gleefully traded my soul at age twelve for a device that gave me a new book anytime I wanted it. But not having that access to books and having a library that had very few 
books that I wanted to read meant that I read the same books over and over again. And that teaches you a lot about how you construct a story because the things you read the first time and the things that grab you the first time probably aren't the same things that grab you the ninth, tenth, eleventh time that you read that same book. And I, I mean, I know I did that with most of the Stephen King books I got because it was going to be a little while, well, not that long, but a little while before the next one. So, you know, that is a, a really great point. Um, I grew up in the rural South also, uh, and your, uh, your access to books is very limited, and uh, you know I read a lot as a kid. My uh, my parents got me books, and and we had a, a a decent public library. The the town I grew up in was about fifty thousand people, and so we had a, a <laughs> that's the metropolis. Uh, yeah, you know. Well, I I grew up outside that town, but that was the closest town to us, ah. uh, and mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. You you do get a small shelf of books. And you read those over and over and over again, and those characters become part of your childhood. Yes. Uh, and and my kids now, uh, we have a, a massive bookshelf that's just full of books. Uh, plus, we have uh, two Kindles, uh, and everyone has a laptop, and everyone has a phone, and mm-hmm. they're all loaded with ebooks. And you know, literally, there are you know no less than five thousand books at your fingertips at any given yes. moment. Uh, and, and that that comes with its own benefits and uh, you know and, and all of that. But there, man, there's something to being tied to to a small set of books that you become intimately ingrained in. I, I think there's still a tendency to reread the very favorites because I know my um, uh, soon to be 12 year old son. He, of course, the Harry Potter books he read. Oh yeah, starting from when he was seven. And then he has reread them on a regular basis. And there are a few others that he'll go back and and reread simply for the joy of rereading it, not out of, you know, there are tons of other books he could read. But um, I think there's still that tendency to go back to your favorites, but it's not going to be nearly uh, the same as it was when it was totally out of necessity. Yeah. Uh, what was it about Stephen King that resonated with you? His characters more than anything else. Um, I, I'm one of those people who I love to read horror fiction or basically any kind of speculative fiction, but I don't like to watch horror movies. Uh, I like to be able to control the spewing arteries and, you know, (laughs) there's just a little bit of blood spatter as opposed to going all over the place. Um, but it's mostly his his characters for me. Um, the books that did not really stick with me well were ones where there just were no characters that jumped out at me or the ones that were too bleak. Uh, one thing that, and this isn't true of King's shorter fiction, but definitely with his novels, in most cases, either good wins or you think there's a possibility that good will win. There's some little element of hope there. Um the one book of his I don't care for, Pet Cemetery, uh, didn't have that. It was so bleak at the end that right. it, I hated it. And uh, I read somewhere that his wife told him that he shouldn't have published that one. And that was my thought. It was, yep, Tabitha, you had it right. <laughs> he should have <laughs> left that one alone. But I know a lot of people who absolutely love that book. So, uh, I, I agree with you there. I am not a fan of horror cinema. Uh, and especially modern, uh, yes. you know, because it's it's like uh, uh, it's like we've become so used to it, and nothing scares us anymore. That we just keep getting more and more gory, and just to get a shock out of people anymore. And and there's something so much more. Uh, there's something more rich to the experience of of slowly building tension and yes. and 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 really you know jarring you uh, you know through the use of of the character development and and the uh, the, the gradually evolving plot uh, and I think that's that's been lost in in cinema. Uh, I, I have the same experience with you with King that uh, that that's what I love and that. And that there's always a glimmer of hope and that, that there's, even though it's dire, that something good, hopefully, will come out of it. And even with the Dark Tower series, even though the, oh, yes. yeah, there's there's just that one little bit there. And for those who haven't read it, I won't entirely give it away. But there's that one tiny 
element of time travel-esque hope that is left at the ending that keeps you from wanting to fling the book across the room like I wanted to do at the Pet Cemetery. That's right. Uh, so so you, you become a, a sci-fi geek, uh, a, a speculative fiction fan. Uh, I, I assume that you start kind of building your repertoire and, and, and building the, uh, uh, the the books that you read and you collect. At what point do you say, okay, I'm going to try my hand at writing fiction? For me, it was pretty much when the whole self-publishing revolution started. Um, and I was in academia. I was teaching college uh, up in Ohio my then teenage son and uh, then fiance were totally bored with middle of nowhere, Ohio. So I got off of the academic merry-go-round and worked with USAID in Washington, D.C. for uh, about five years. And then after that, there was a period where I was trying to balance having two kids at home and uh, two small kids at home with working in downtown D.C., and I started, I decided to start teaching online again instead of uh, trying to do that horrible commute. And that gave me a little more time because I was at home. And it also, uh, I was able to teach a little more history than I'd been able to teach uh, before then. And started re started, it started reawakening the idea that I could teach, uh, or excuse me, I could write fiction. And then I had um, a um, friend of mine, once I had finished the manuscript for what was then called Time's Twisted Arrow, she told me, if you're not willing to self-publish this, I'll front the money for it. And I would never have taken her up on it. But between that and my sister, who my sister has to tell me she likes it, so I didn't entirely believe her, um, between those two, I decided to take the plunge and self-publish it, but I also entered the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award contest at the same time, and that's really what made a difference for my career was was winning ABNA. Uh, it, I was doing okay, entirely indie, but that gave the series a boost that it, it simply wouldn't have had otherwise. So uh, was there any tension uh, between your academic uh, career and self-publishing? Um, there really wasn't because I was teaching online and it was one of those situations where the university that I was with, um, they had, they were going downhill. I, I don't know any other way to say it. They had started out as an online university that I had some respect for, but they had moved away from having um, testing done in person and we're now focusing more on having it done online so there was less credibility I felt and then I was putting so much of my creative energy into building up these uh, online teaching modules pulling in video a lot of this my fixation with the 1893 World's Fair that's evident to anybody who reads uh, reads Timebound uh, that came from a module that I put together and they they had a situation where they didn't pay me for some work I did. And I thought, well, that is it. I will teach my classes, but you're not getting any more of my creative energy. And my immediate boss completely understood that. And in that period when I was totally pissed off at the upper administration, that's when I finished the uh, final draft for Times Twisted Arrow, which eventually became Time Bound. So it was that pure anger. The thinking, I put all this work into it, and you're going to pay me a thousand dollars instead of the five thousand you agreed. Nope, this isn't happening. So, <laughs> wow. So, is Time Bound? Uh, is that the book that you submitted to the? Um, uh, yes, it to is. The it was Award? originally. Uh, yes, it was originally Time's Twisted Arrow. Um, after it won the Young Adult Prize, um, they talked to me about a title change, which. They're right. I needed something that was a little shorter and a little uh, catchier. So we went with uh, Time Bound, and then it ended up winning the grand prize, and they bought the rest of the series, with the exception of the novellas. And that's why I am 
a hybrid author instead of only traditionally published is they weren't weren't all that enthusiastic about the novellas, even though I'd always seen the series as a three book, two novella arc. And I told them, I said, well, I want the right to self-publish them then. And they said, fine, go ahead. Awesome. Yeah, it, uh, it really has been because uh, I've, I've made quite a lot of money off of the two novellas <laughs> as a result of the fact that the royalties are higher for self-published, obviously. Oh, and yeah. That's that's made a huge difference. I was able to have the experience of going through ACX and getting uh, narrators for the um, the two novellas, and that's been fun too. Being able to audition and uh, figure out who was the best voice. Although I ended up going with the same one for the female novella as did the main series because Kate Rudd is just incredibly awesome and brings along her own fan base to the mix. Nice. Uh, it's such an interesting thing. Uh, my interview last week was with uh, Michael Patrick Hicks, who was also uh, a, uh, a uh, the Breakthrough Kindle Award. Uh, mm-hmm. He was a semifinalist. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he submitted his first book also and, and made it uh, uh, all the way down to just about to the end. Uh-huh. Uh, do you have any advice for people? Uh, I think it's fascinating that, that the first book that you uh, write, you submit, and, and get that far. That's incredible. Uh, <laughs> that but- was my thought as well because <laughs> I was really, really hoping to make it to the quarterfinals. Yeah. And the reason for that is you get the free um, Publishers Weekly review. And right. you, you probably know how Publishers Weekly is. I mean, you've got Kirkus over there. You submit it to their indies, and yes, it's going to have the indie stamp on it. But when you pay that, they will review your book. It may eviscerate your book, right. but they will review it, whereas Publishers Weekly, you submit it to them, and they're like, well, we'll consider reviewing it. And I wasn't going there. So <laughs> when I entered it into uh, the awards, I felt like I'd won when I got the uh, review that said that Kate was the Katniss Everdeen of time travel. I'm going, it's tweetable. It's tweetable. (laughs) So I, at that point, you know, I didn't, I really didn't believe that it would make it until to the end. It was just my youngest son who's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course he also said it was going to be a movie and that hasn't happened yet. So (laughs) Uh, how, how long was that process from submitting Uh, it and then going through the finals? You Submitted it in, oh, I'm thinking it was mid-January, and then you have several different steps along the way where they, it starts out with 10,000, they weed it down, I think it's 2,000 is the next step, and then progressively until you end up with the final five. And this was actually the first, 2013 when I won, was the first time that it had been Amazon Publishing that was taking uh, the contracts. And... I entered in 2012 as well, and I screwed something up. I, I'm pretty sure I left my name on one of the files. And um, going back and looking at it, I'm so glad I left it on there because when Penguin had charge of it, they basically published the books, and then they just kind of disappeared. And that's sad because some of those winners were actually very good books, um, whereas Amazon had some incentive to want to actually market the books. And so winning in 2012 probably wouldn't have made a big difference to my career. Winning in 2013 absolutely did. That's an incredible story. Uh, so what month was the uh, – were the winners uh, um, They announced, announced the, um, the finalists in May, in early May. And then in 2013, they still had the award ceremony out in Seattle. They didn't do that in 2014. So they flew – each finalist and a guest out to um, Seattle for the award ceremony. So I didn't know whether I'd won until that evening. And um, that's where my family actually came in really handy because I come from a family of Southern politicians and they may not understand (laughs) much about writing a book, but when I was able to tell them uh, it's online now and people can vote, they're like, election, we got this. (laughs) We can get out the vote. (laughs) Pressing the digital flesh, as it were. Exactly. And that made a huge difference because 
it, the finalists, I mean, everybody had a contract with their respective um, Amazon imprint, but it was $15,000 for the finalists and it was 50000 advance for the grand prize. And that was almost exactly what I was making for a year of teaching online. So it was the difference for me between being able to maybe not teach in the summer and quitting the day job. So... I, was that a nerve-wracking half year, though, from it was. <laughs> submitting to getting through, getting through the whole process? It, it was, and yet it, it was a lot of fun, too. Um, and I don't know that I still would have had the courage to actually quit the day job if it wasn't for the fact that the mortgage was could be paid by my husband at that point. <laughs> And it was it was a matter of, OK, we won't have some extras if the first book goes nowhere and if they don't buy because I still didn't know at that point that they were going to buy the rest of the series. But and, and I still get nervous every now and then, even though the last book comes out in October and they bought my next series. Uh, so <laughs> it's still like, OK, at the end of the next three years, am I going to have to go back to teaching online? So <laughs> Right. Uh, but, you know, the in the. The economy and job market that we live in, you know, uh, very few people have the same career for uh, their whole professional life. And exactly. I, I think a, a lot of people live with that same tension, uh, you know, that every three to five years, you know, there may be a big shakeup in our life. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think that, that that's necessarily any more different than, than the average person. And, and I don't think it's a bad thing because it keeps you learning. It keeps you you know, pushing forward. That's, I mean, that's one reason that I, one thing I liked about teaching and being in academia is that you kind of had to keep on top of your game. And that's the same thing that I kind of like about having one foot in indie publishing as well as traditional publishing is that I still have to keep an eye on the marketing. I still have to understand um, what I need to do for a book launch uh, and it helps me even to, I, I think, be more effective traditionally published because no matter what that non-existent creature called an agent may tell writers, um, they're going to have to do a whole lot of their marketing. And if they don't do the marketing, they're probably not going to do very well. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, the, the world is a, a very different place than the romanticized idea that you see in the movies of yes. the writer who – locks him or herself in, in the attic with a typewriter and just, you know, throws a finished novel out the window and you yeah, know, I mean, you spend goes as much to the Hamptons. Time, you spend as much time marketing, really, as you do writing. Oh, yeah. Um, and sometimes more, depending on what, you know, how involved in it you are. Uh, I have to pull away sometimes and say, no, I'm in the writing cave. I'm not going to be on Facebook. I'm not going to be on Twitter because I have a deadline hanging over my head like a cartoon anvil. And, you know, readers are, are pretty good about that, especially if you're if you're involved with them the rest of the year and they, they can kind of follow along with you. And they also know that they're not going to get that final book if you don't get in there and write it. So, yeah. Um, t so tell us about uh, the Kronos Files, uh, Time Bound. Where did that first book, where did the idea come from and uh and did you envision it as as you have mentioned that you uh, you know see it as three novels and two novellas? Is that the way you originally saw it, or uh, that, kind of how how did this idea hatch? Okay, um, once I was once I had the first book finished, I definitely knew it was going to be a three novel series from the main characters first person perspective with two novellas in the middle that kind of flesh things out from two other characters perspectives. And that's, that worked out really well. Uh, when I was first playing around with the idea for the series, it, it actually changed a good bit. Um, I was thinking initially more middle grade. Uh, I had a protagonist who was like 15 years old and as I got into it, I thought, no, no, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> I can't write middle grade. And truthfully, my books are YA because the protagonist is 17 years old. Um, but the vast, vast majority of my readers are adults. Uh, I would say the average age of my readers is around 35. And that was something different than what I originally planned because I was looking at it more as a way of teaching interesting history. I had, 
every time I get a history book, I get annoyed because the fun stuff wasn't in there. It left out the serial killers. It left out the quirky politicians, <laughs> you know, the, right. the little anecdotes that I knew about history that should be in there weren't in there. And so that's kind of what I set out to do was to make it so that by the time readers ended up in college, they didn't automatically have a predisposition toward history as something boring. Right. Uh, and so that was my original goal. And then once I got in there and started writing fiction, I found out I'm very much one of those people that the characters take over. Uh, and they do whatever the hell they want to do. <laughs> and if I don't listen to them, they stop talking to me. So um, and I know another writer will understand that better than <laughs> oh, yeah. some people do. But I mean, I know people who can plot and to some extent, I did have to plot because it is a very complex time travel series. But for the most part, it was a matter of sitting down and letting the characters figure it out for themselves and ripping out what didn't work. And uh, so I discovered that my protagonist was actually 17 uh, and several characters that I thought would be very minor ended up playing a very major role. So um, it it was a learning process, and I suspect the next series is going to be the same. Um, the The Chronos Files has it, it's time travel dealing with a group of historians from the future who get stranded in the past uh, through an act of sabotage, and they're sabotaged by a guy who thinks he's going to be able to jump around from place to place um, and change history to his liking. But he discovers that he's stranded himself along with the others. And it's not until some of their offspring uh, develop this Kronos gene that allows them to use the equipment that he ends up being able to make the changes he wanted to make. And uh, his change is to create a new religion because he thinks that that would be the most effective way to um, to change the world. And let's just say it's not a very nice religion. He has, um, he has very, uh, it's sort of Ayn Rand smashed with, uh, conservative Christianity in a weird mix. <laughs> and he, he, and that doesn't sound like it would fit well together. And in some ways, um, uh, it's kind of moralistic, uh, mixed with very every man for himself kind exactly. of exactly um and and very much focused on your worth is how much you earn uh, uh, and in the eyes of cyrus in the eyes of the it's the the cyrus church is the uh the one that he founds and so it's a uh it's it's a strange mix that results in a an interesting alternate uh history and the goal is of, of the main character is to put things back to the base that she knew, which still isn't our universe, but um, just to keep him from, uh, from going overboard. And I won't say any more than that because it kind of spoils some stuff. Intriguing. Uh, what is it about time travel stories? Uh, what is it about those stories? Do you think uh, that resonates with so many people? I think it really taps into the what if, because there's so many things, so many junctures in history where if one little thing had been different, everything might have been. So it's, it's alternate history in some sense, too, which I'm, I'm going to be writing an alternate history story soon. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. But it's that's part of it. And, and I think it's nobody who likes time travel hates history. So I think it's also a way for the inner history geek to come out and play a little bit. I mean, some of my stuff is is in an alternate future, but a lot of it is focused on actually very real history. The 1893 World's Fair and the first one, um, the second one is set partially in, in the Deep South, 1938, uh, deals with a lynching. Um, there is a, um, a section from Oh, um, 1872, um, Victoria Woodhull's presidential campaign, which barely ever gets any uh, 
treatment in the press. Most people don't know a woman ran for president that long ago. Uh, little things like that that I was able to bring out and put in there. And those are the things that quite often really do resonate with the readers because they'll then go back and they'll be like, that was real. Uh, a weird little um, sect in Florida called the Koresh and Unity that I, I grew up in Florida, went through Florida schools and had never heard of this group, but they believed that the earth was hollow and we lived inside it. And um, it was a, a strange little religious commune that started in the 1890s down in southern Florida, and there were still remnants of it up until the late 1960s. So those kind of strange little historical things that I was able to pull in, I think that really appeals to a lot of time travel readers. And, and just because those of us that believe the world is hollow, uh, you don't have to look down your nose at us. <laughs> <laughs> they were, it was a cool group, it really oh. was a cool group, um, and wow. they they are co-opted by the Cyrus in my um, in my stories. So uh, they started nice. out as the Corruption, and the guy that was one of those cases of strange serendipity because the guy who started, I had already decided the lead character or that head of the religion would call himself Cyrus, Brother Cyrus. And Cyrus Teed is the name of the guy who started that. And I had never heard of him until I started poking around for strange little groups. And the Corrections landed on my radar. <laughs> that is so cool. I, I love uh, getting those little historical nuggets that, uh, that you can really explore without uh, tainting uh, what – what actual history would be, if that makes sense, <laughs> you know, the, the the little things that you can mold a story into and but won't alter the, uh, the the course of the universe, so to speak. Yes. And the at the end of each one of the books, I go through and I say, OK, here's the stuff that is actually history. And I've had to start putting it on my blog, too, because I realized how many people listen to the audio books. And that's the one thing that isn't in there are those notes at the end. So um, it's. That that has been fun to go through and keep those notes, and so I guess the history teacher side of me still uh, survives and has to cite its sources. That's that's so cool. Um, I wrote a time travel book called Mulligan, and the first act of it has the protagonist going to the Deep South in 1929 oh. uh, and encountering some <laughs> now of those. I'm gonna have to look that one up. <laughs> some of those same things. That's uh, uh that's fascinating. That uh, I wonder what. Uh, percentage of time travel books focus on the past as opposed to the future. Um, I think and most of them do, at I, least to some extent. I think so too. Uh, you know, every time that I see a time travel book and one that, that catches my imagination, it's always us going back and trying mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, either affect change or it, it's, you know, this, there's this deep subconscious, uh, you know, want to get in touch with our roots, or I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, most time travel in, in my experience has been, you know, us wanting to go back and right a wrong or participate in something exactly. that we that we feel like will give us uh, a better connection to who we are. I, I think for me, very much the trip to 1938 Georgia, I, I grew up I mean, Florida resisted, at least the area of Florida I was in, resisted uh, um, desegregating the schools for a very long time. And we oh, saw sure. a lot of racial tension. Even when I was in high school, we actually um, had had some deaths as a result. And I, growing up, in my view now, on the wrong side of that conflict, <laughs> I think there's a lot of that. I I understand how it happened because I grew up hearing all of the arguments for schools remaining segregated um, and hearing a lot of things that I totally disagree with as an adult. But when you're a child and you're going through that, you obviously, you hear what your parents say and, and you accept it. And right. so I think for, for me, a lot of it and going back to that period was to manage to show that there were a lot of very good people who were worried about racial tensions on both sides, um, right. and not to demonize either side. Uh, and 
I think I actually towed that line fairly well in Time's Edge because I I was very worried about Southerners reading it and coming after me. But um, most most of the ones who've read it have said that that they thought I presented it fairly. And uh, it, it was an interesting one to write because of that, because I had to kind of work through my own childhood a little bit in doing it. And, and one thing you discover, at least I have discovered, is that uh, in every situation that's contentious, there are good people mm-hmm. uh, in the background who are doing uh, small acts of kindness yes. or small things – uh, that ultimately make a big difference, yes. and those those people don't get the headline stories, uh, but it's because of those people that we're able to sit in a better place now. Exactly, and and I love exploiting those people's stories. And that's that's one thing that I pick up specifically on in uh, Times Edge, and then I, I have one example. Um, there, they have been pelted with all manner of fecal matter, eggs whatever at their vehicle and they come out and somebody has washed it. They don't know who, they never know who did it, but somebody washed that off their vehicle. And that kind of small act that they never know who did it. They never, you know, it just kind of passes. I don't even focus on it heavily, but that makes a big difference just in the way that you view your situation when you are a racial minority or when you are somebody who is support. Uh, supporting a social change that is um, frowned upon. So uh, that was it, it was it was a fun book to write. I, the last one goes to the future. So that was my first foray into uh, writing about uh, kind of an alternate future history in the 2300s. And um, but other than that, yeah, I've, I've stuck to the past pretty much. What are some of the challenges of writing in the future, and is there any trepidation uh, that you're going to, uh, you know, write something that uh, that in the future will seem silly? You, do, you, do you understand what I'm asking? It's, it's a little easier with time travel because you can always go, well, sorry, that was an alternate time. <laughs> Yes. I mean, you know, you can just kind of write it off. Or um, you can go far enough. Alternate to... timeline. But yes, yeah. there is that fear because, it, well, I'll give an example actually from the next series that I'm writing, which right after I finished Time's Twisted Arrow, when I was actually when I was going through all the stuff with um, the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award, I started what will be my next series, the Delphi Project. And I had the, the girl in that series with a flip phone. And Two and a half years later, I mean, it was supposed to be an older phone, but two and a half years later, that just dated it because I don't care how old. <laughs> there's right. there's no way a 17-year-old is going to be walking around carrying a flip phone, no matter how poor she is. She's going to have something else. Um, right. And that kind of thing, and just, I mean, watching Star Trek, looking at um, the technology that was on the bridge, and I mean, some of it obviously is still very forward thinking, but... Um, it, it is something that you worry about. You worry about something just being dated and being dated quickly. One good thing about writing in 2300, however, is you can push it further ahead. And that's easier to me than writing 2020. Yes. Because my guess is, I mean, I hope somebody's still reading my stuff in 2300, but <laughs> probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so at least not very often. So yeah. um, that's, that's the difference. Somebody hopefully we'll still be reading it in 2020. And that's where you have to worry a little more about dating it. But there's a balance between worrying too much about dating yourself and not having that authenticity there. Um, For instance, I'm never going to have my character drinking a frozen drink as opposed to drinking a Frappuccino. Um, I'm never going to go in any they're going to listen to bands that they might listen to today because I think that makes a connection between the reader and the character. Um, even though that's the advice that you'll get from agents and, you know, writing uh, experts is that you should avoid dating what you're writing by putting in those kinds of references. But it, I think you lose too much if you, you know, pull out all brand names and, have her drinking a soda instead of a diet Dr. Pepper. You know, it, no. 
Well, and if if you look at uh, certain cases like Ernest Cline uh, with his uh, hit book Ready Player mm-hmm. One, uh, you know the 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 whole strength of that book is that he relies so heavily on the seventies and eighties references. Uh, and absolutely it dates the book, but that's yes. what endears it to people so much is that they get these recollections of their childhood I, I just uh, finished and their living, adolescence. I just finished living in the 80s for the um, – because of the fact the second novella is self-published, I wrote it after the final book in the series. And so I've just gotten that out there this past month, Time's Mirror, which is written from the perspective of um, – well, when it starts, a 14-year-old from 1984 who ends up in the future. And she's very, very homesick for the 1980s. And one of the best launch parties I ever had was this launch party on Facebook because I made it an 80s launch party. And so many of my readers were teens and kids during that period, or their parents know that period. And boy, they came in with all kinds of trivia and music and all this kind of stuff. So we had a wonderful launch party because of that nostalgia. And there are all kinds of 80s references in that novella um, because that's where she was coming from. And getting back to Stephen King, he had many references like that in his books that pulled you in to the characters. The characters didn't do generic things. They watched a specific TV show. They read a specific book or whatever. And I think that's why his characters are strong, why I have always identified with them more is because I, I felt like I knew them. Yeah, and, and he builds uh, regional characters really well yes. and settings. And uh, even if you've never you know traveled to the northeast of the mm-hmm. United States, if you read enough Stephen King – you know, you'll you'll start to to build a familiarity uh, you think you with know that. Maine, even if you don't, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, let's talk just a moment about process. Uh, what is your creative process like? Uh, I, you mentioned earlier that you don't necessarily outline. Uh, are you a strict pantser? Uh, do you work through a a, a loose outline, uh, or do you? just kind of dream up the next scene and and Um, type it out? It varies. There are some sections that are slightly plotted. Um, Yeah. But when I was writing up a synopsis for the new series, Delphi Project, I went back to look at the synopsis I put together when I was pitching um, the last two books in the Kronos Files to Skyscape after, um, after winning Abna. And... I I mean, that's an interesting synopsis. I might write those books one day, (laughs) but they are not what I ended up writing. And so that's kind of what I told my editor. I said, uh, if you look back at the other one, um, so I'm I'm not going to give you a lot of specifics here. I'm going to give you the general outlines and um, we'll fill it in as we go along. Um, I do usually when I'm first starting a work, I sit down with a notebook and a pencil and jot down some notes. And they, half of them are never going to end up in the book, but they're more, you know, just train of thought, character kind of things. Um, And then I sit down and I start writing, and that's usually not the beginning. I'll usually end up going back and adding something else at the beginning. And once I have my characters, the story flows pretty quickly. It's um, getting those characters down that makes a difference for me. Because once I have the characters down and I get them in the room and I know what the situation is, the general you know, situation they're going to encounter, um, that's what's going to determine what happens. And if I do not listen to them, they stop talking to me. And then I have to step back and figure out what I did wrong and rip it out and go back to the spot and say, okay, fine, I'm listening. <laughs> And yeah, it makes you sound like you're crazy, but <laughs> no, I, I, and, and writers totally get that. You know, you you don't want uh, to piss off the the characters because they won't come back. Uh, do you write every day? Uh, you know, lots of writers say well, you need to build that muscle and and you need to make those habits and write every single day. Uh, and I, I don't. would love to. Yeah, I would love to say that I do that. Um, but I would also say that. I'm constantly writing in my head, yeah. working out scenes and characters and things like that. What, how do you approach that? 
there are some days when I have so much marketing stuff going on that I never make it to the <laughs> keyboard yeah. to write, um, particularly right before a launch. Um, I, I don't have an agent, and to be brutally honest, I don't want one. Um, and But I am to the point now where I think for this next book launch, I am going to hire a publicist and hand some of that over to them. Um, but, you know, there's there's so much with marketing the self-published works and stuff like that, that and answering emails, you end up some days where you just don't get any writing done. And for me, there are some days when I wake up and my brain just doesn't want to go there. It's it's it's, sometimes I will try to write on something else. And that's particularly if I'm at a um, at a spot where I'm kind of stuck. Sometimes if I write on something else, if I've got a short story that I need to be writing or whatever, I can shift over and write on that a little bit. And um, then eventually I get to the spot. But I'm also very much deadline driven. Um, I will get myself into one of those situations where I have the deadline hanging over my head and I'll pull a couple of all nighters and <laughs> and it, it works because you go into that zone where you're so caffeine fueled and chocolate fueled where it's just um, and I think that comes also from from spending as long as I did teaching and in graduate school where you had those deadlines and sometimes you did pull the all-nighters in order to actually get things done and so far I've managed when when I procrastinate I've still managed to make it but um, I'm gonna try to be better this next series the next series is not time travel um, my brain desperately needs a time travel break because there were so many, I've got three or four different realities going on by the time you get to the last book. So getting all of those threads to connect together for the end, um, was interesting. And my brain felt like somebody had shoved it through a colander and it was just coming out. And so at any rate, the next series is still speculative fiction. It's still YA for adults is about the only way to put it because it's young adult characters, but I, I know better than to think it's really going to be mostly teens that read it. And um, it's, but it's not time travel. I love that YA for adults. Uh, I think that is a great designation. Uh, Risa, this has been a fantastic interview. Um, tell everyone where they can find you on the web. And uh, I know that you said that. Uh, uh, that you spend too much time on Facebook and, and we're supposed to tell you to get back to the writing yes. cave. Uh, but where can we find you and where can people connect with you and uh, and get plugged into your work and, and fall down the rabbit hole with you? Well, I'm very lucky to have a four-letter URL, risa.com. Um, so that's, yeah, that's easy amazing. to remember. Um, and I am also on Facebook way too often. You can find me there. Just search for Risa Walker and you'll find me. For some reason, it's Risa Walker 3, even though there are not three Risa Walkers anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Risa Walker at um, Twitter as well. Uh, those are the three I'm at with a, yeah, pretty often. Um, and I'm also, uh, because I'm published by uh, Skyscape, which is an Amazon imprint, um, I'm, I have a uh, fairly easy to remember author page. It's just uh, Amazon.com slash author slash Walker, and you can find all of my books there. Cool. And you have links on uh, Risa.com to your Facebook and your Twitter, I see. Yes, uh, So that makes it easy. Uh, Risa, thank you so much uh, for coming on. Uh, when is your next release coming out? Um, well, there's a tiny blip of a release coming out hopefully within a week when the audio um, which has been a little bit delayed for the self-published novella Times Mirror um, will hopefully hit audible I'm hoping that'll be by the end of the month and then October 20th the final book in the Chronos Files Times Divide will launch and then after that it's on to another series which has me a little nervous <laughs> Well, great. We can all use our Audible credit for next month for your new book coming out, and we'll look forward to that. Uh, Risa Walker, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, Hank.